when you're a kid, you think the universe revolves around you. You think that you'll always be protected and cared for. Then, one day, you realize that's not true. Because when you're alone as a kid, the monsters see you as weaker. You don't even know they're getting closer. No! Until it's too late. Father thinks this town is cursed. That all the bad things that happen in this town are because of one thing. An evil thing. Bill, if you will come with me, we'll float too. I saw something. A clown. Yeah, I saw him too. What happens when another Georgie goes missing? Or one of us? Are you just gonna pretend it isn't happening like everyone else in this town? If we stick together, we'll win. I used to live here. Won't you come in? It's the least I can do. Is it like you remember? Cleaner. Well, you feel free to look around while I get the water boiling. Your hair is winter fire. January embers. My heart burns there. Some music. I do apologize. It gets so very hot here this time of year. It's fine. Well, you feel like you could just about die. <laughs> but you know what they say about Derry? Hmm. No one who dies here ever really dies. Tell me, how is it being back in Derry? It's good. Strange. Strange? Oh, my. I had some cookies in the oven before you came. Stay right there. I no. shouldn't impose. I'm gonna... No, 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 no. I insist. Your photos are lovely, Miss Kirsch. Are these your family? My father came to this country with $14 in his pocket. What did he do, Mrs. Kirsch? My father joined the circus. I was always daddy's little girl. What about you? Are you still his little girl, Beverly? Are you? Me and the Losers Club has officially begun. We can do this, but we have to stick together. Hello.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I am your host, the incredible Josh. Thanks so much for coming to check us out every week. And when we release our episodes randomly throughout the week, (laughs) I appreciate everyone who's messaged, sent feedback, shared their thoughts and their opinions on horror movies when I asked them in my stories. Um, I absolutely love all of you. Thank you so much for all of your support. Everyone who listens to the podcast, you're all horror family to me. So I absolutely love each and every one of you. So thank you for checking it out. This is why I do what I do. I absolutely love horror. (laughs) I love the horror genre and I love horror movies. And I love sharing all of that with you guys. I love sharing my love of horror with all of you and that you actually find value and (laughs) enjoy listening to me talk about the horror genre. So thank you everyone who tunes in. I appreciate each and every one of you for the support. And I hope you like this episode. We're actually going to be going over Stephen King's It in this terrifying tale of Pennywise. Uh, (laughs) Today's episode is going to be talking a little bit about the book itself. I actually read Stephen King's It, all thousand plus pages of it. (laughs) I I read it after I watched the Tim Curry adaptation, and I definitely noticed that there was some differences. There was definitely things in the Tim Curry version of, of It that was missing things from the book, and it didn't necessarily contain a lot of the themes that I was really hoping it would. Where the the remake, the recent It movies, definitely did. While I may not like that movie so much, it was a lot closer to the book than the miniseries was. But the book itself was great. It was absolutely terrifying. It was so it was just so graphically descriptive, and the way you were able to just depict everything in your mind as it was going down made the story even that much more terrifying. <laughs> like the fact that Pennywise himself manifests based on your fear is just a terrifying concept for one no pun intended, and is something that could really only come from the mind of Stephen King, right? Stephen King is an absolute literary mastermind and horror genius. The guy has scared us for decades, whether it be from TV shows that he's written or novels he's written in the past. All of them have been absolutely terrifying. But it in particular really captured imaginations and scared the pants off of absolutely everyone who read it and everyone who saw either movie, whether it be the Tim Curry version or the recent reboot, either one of those is bound to be absolutely terrifying to you. The novel itself had a really unique structure because it jumped between two narratives while featuring the same group of protagonists as children and adults. And the two narratives were set 27 years apart, which gave Stephen King a chance to really explore the development of his characters and the history of his setting like he never has in any of his novels before that. And the story introduced us to one of the most terrifying villains in all of fiction, Pennywise the Dancing Clown. And you can't disagree that Pennywise is one of the most terrifying characters, not only in literary fiction, but in the horror genre, right? (laughs) Like... And I bet you didn't know that the novel itself, the Stephen King's It novel, was inspired by the three Billy Goats gruff. (laughs) In the afterword to the 25th anniversary edition of Stephen King's original novel, uh, he actually offered some insight into how Pennywise came to be. And as he tells it, while he was crossing a wooden bridge over a dry creek bed, he thought back to one of the horror stories of his own childhood, The Three Billy Goats Gruff. He remembered how the story's troll, who lived under the bridge, would approach its victims with the question of, who is that trip trapping on my bridge? This question, King says, struck him, even as a child, as innocent on top, but very sinister beneath. So that was really how the core foundation of Pennywise started to form, right? Innocent on top, but sinister beneath. That's really the most accurate description of Pennywise. (laughs) Because if you just looked at Pennywise, he's a dancing clown, right? At the end of the day, that's not necessarily something that's intimidating, terrifying, or you believe is going to be of danger to you. It's just a fucking clown. But it's very sinister and underneath, right? Underneath all that makeup, underneath all that costume, there's something very sinister, which they did an amazing job of depicting when it came to the Stephen King it and even the reboot. Despite how much CGI was used in the reboot, that's really my biggest biggest complaint about the reboot was the amount of CGI that was used. I get why. I get why there was that much CGI used, but that's really my biggest complaint. I'm just going to get that out there, is that they used way too much CGI in that movie, that it was just too over the top, too comical in a sense, and it wasn't necessarily scary, where Tim Curry was able to just completely encapsulate horror and fear and strike it deep into our hearts with just his sheer presence, his the way he portrayed Pennywise, the way he held himself in that role. It was absolutely terrifying, and they didn't need a whole bunch of CGI to make that happen. 
So the inspiration that King got from the three bully goats gruff led him to begin thinking about the fantastical fears of our childhood in contrast to our more mundane adult fears. And he began to see a structure where he could alternate children battling real monsters with the adults they become years later. And he put that idea on the back burner, but then over the course of a couple of years, it wouldn't leave him alone. It kept gnawing at him in the back of his mind. So he had a flash of inspiration and the idea of the troll under the bridge came back to him but he decided what if that bridge could be a city and underneath it was tunnels, a sewer. Aha, what a good place for a troll to be. Or in this case, Pennywise the Dancing Clown. So by the summer of 1981, he'd fleshed out the entire story enough in his mind that he began researching in earnest. And the inspiration for Derry was actually the town of Bangor, Maine. This is where King and his family were living at the time when the novel was first developed, and it served as the inspiration for its setting. The city's very character and sense of troubled history inspired him to portray Derry as something of a character in its own right. So Derry itself really, and you feel that when you're reading Stephen King's It, that Derry itself is a character all on its own. Like the town itself is a character, and then you have all of the actual, you know, quote-unquote people characters right? Stephen King did a very good job in turning his location into a character in its own right and used it as an extension of Pennywise the Dancing Clown. And King mentions as well that he was walking around town thinking about the novel and asking himself questions of what happened here and here and here. Because he knew Banger had been a rough place back in the day and he wanted to know what people remembered, what the worst things that people remembered about that town. And he learned about several different tragic, half-forgotten pieces of the city's history. There was a fireman at a serviceman's nightclub. There was a Depression-era shootout with some bad boys called the Brady Gang. And he also learned about the miles of sewers beneath the city. Some of them had long since been abandoned. So that's when he really began to incorporate fictionalized versions of some of these stories into his manuscript and giving Derry a violent pattern past in which major tragedies seem to happen every 27 years, which always coincides with a rash of child murders, all destined to be largely forgotten until the cycle starts again. So as you can see, as he's... So King's beginning to put all of the pieces together, right? Everything that we see from the story of It and Pennywise the Dancing Clown... This is where everything starts to form into what we know and love today. King actually shared some words on when it kind of clicked to him that the clown may be the best way to go for the villain. What he says is, I was on a book tour, my first big book tour. I'm sitting in first class and the door opens and Ronald McDonald gets on the airplane. The clown sat right next to Stephen King and proceeded to light up a cigarette and order a cocktail. So unable to resist, Stephen King asked the clown where he was coming from. And the clown promptly replied, McDonald land. <laughs> The man turned out to be a potential McDonald's franchise owner on his way from a meeting in Chicago, but the incident really started to turn Stephen King's gears in his head. You talk about surreal, and you think, what if this plane crashes? I'm going to die next to a clown. <laughs> Once Stephen King actually released It, It was... <laughs> it's so hard to say the book because it's It. So the novel It became an instant fan favorite. Absolutely everybody loved it. It was immediately put on one of the best Stephen King books lists of all time kind of deal and immediately ABC optioned the rights for it. They wanted to adapt the story into a television project, which eventually became the miniseries we got in 1990. So they obviously had to start working on a script for it. So, so King turned to his pair of trusted collaborators who helped him adapt his novel Carrie into the highly successful movie that it was. And it could have actually been a much very different look and feel and overall style when it was released as the miniseries. Because the second collaborator that actually came aboard the miniseries was George A. Romero. King had worked with him on Creep Show, so he had brought him in to actually direct the miniseries. Lawrence Cohen, who was helping write the screenplay with Stephen King for the It miniseries, explained in an interview with ComingSoon.net that the miniseries had a very different conceptualization early in production. He said that there was no restriction as to how many hours the miniseries was going to be. It could have been 8, 10, or even 12. And the guys had already had George Romero in mind to direct it because they thought he was a genius match for this particular piece. So Romero and Cohen worked on the project for a better part of a year, hammering out the story structure, which they believed really lent itself perfectly to the standard network TV miniseries structure of that time. And the two were excited about the opportunity to bring the novel to life on television. The plan was actually to run it for 10 hours originally, so it was going to be a 10-hour miniseries. 
although the networks start to lose its nerve over time, so they first cut it from 10 to 8 hours, and that started to worry the filmmakers, because it itself was a horror magnum opus, right? It demands a marathon rather than a sprint in a sense, right? It's a big story, and in order for that story to really hit home and really spark something in audiences, it has to contain the lore that the book does. It can't just be a mishmash 90-minute movie that's going to contain some highlights and plot points from the book. That's just not going to work. That's not how Stephen King wrote this story. So as the amount of time in the miniseries kept getting cut, they eventually lost Romero because they felt that the story was getting diluted the shorter that it became, which I, I can completely understand that sentiment, right? So eventually the runtime kept going down and premiered as a two-part, four-hour miniseries in 1990. So they cut it down from 10 hours to four hours for the miniseries. Despite all the positive attention that the new It film received, that the miniseries received, that the novel itself received, everybody loves the character Pennywise, the dancing clown. And because of all this nostalgia, one might think that Stephen King would consider revisiting Pennywise at some point in his writing career. It's not like there isn't a precedent, right? Because the author took 22 years to complete the seven novels in Dark Tower <laughs> and then waited another eight years to write the eighth novel in the series. <laughs> so, and he also wrote a direct sequel to The Shining, right? Dr. Sleep, which is one of his most beloved works. And that was released 36 years after the original. So it's not out of the realm of possibility to think that Stephen King may actually write another novel surrounding Pennywise the Dancing Clown. But King actually made it clear to fans waiting for a return trip to Derry that they're going to have to wait a long time. Uh, it was actually during a Reddit AMA in June 2013. Somebody asked Stephen King directly if there was any hope of getting a sequel to It. And he dashed fans' hopes by saying, I don't think I could bear to deal with Pennywise again. Too scary, even for me. So Pennywise the Dancing Clown was even too terrifying for the man who created him. <laughs> So that's why we will most likely not get another installment anytime soon, if ever, uh, because Stephen King is just way too terrified of the character. And I can understand that as a, as a horror writer myself, getting lost in a character and writing the settings and getting lost in the story, you begin to just immerse yourself in that environment. And it does become terrifying in a sense, because you have to really put yourself in that situation to really get the impact you want across in the book. So by putting yourself in a situation with Pennywise that you feel is real because you need to get that emotion, that can be terrifying, so I can understand. Next, what I'm thinking we should do on this episode of the podcast is actually go over the entire plot of Stephen King's It, the novel, and then we're going to take some time to compare the novel itself between the miniseries and the reboot movie to see what was missed and what was left out of those two entries. But before we dive deep into that, we're going to head on over to Instagram and we're going to hear what some of my followers have to say about the It franchise. So first up, we have xxandy.blxckxx, who says that Tim Curry's It is their favorite movie out of the franchise and they absolutely love Pennywise. Couldn't agree more. The Stephen King It just feels more like a horror movie to me. It doesn't feel as comical as the reboot does. It's just something that they created with practical effects, great makeup and costumes, and awesome acting. Tim Curry is absolutely terrifying as Pennywise. That man can do no wrong, and that man can act himself out of a paper bag. He is a treasure. Next up, we've got Ram Tilda Man, who prefers the original over the remake. Awesome. Definitely one of my people. Dark Sparks. Same thing, says definitely the OG over the original. We've got another one from Nick Horror Fan 88 who says the original is classic, but the first reboot is entertaining. It is entertaining because it's comical. <laughs> because it's not terrifying. It's not scary. It's comical. It's definitely entertaining, but I wouldn't say it's scary in any way. Uh, we've also got Steel underscore Lens underscore Cinema who likes the remake, part one only. What I'm curious to know is that people who like the remake versus the original version with Tim Curry, whether or not they saw the Tim Curry version first or if they saw it second, and also what generation they're in, because I feel like that plays a huge part in which it movie you like. Because if you're part of the newer generation that wasn't really around or watched the Tim Curry It, then you probably like this new version a hell of a lot more and you wouldn't like the Tim Curry version. So I'm just, I'm very curious to know more about the people that like it, <laughs> that like the remake, because it's just fascinating to me. We've also got Dime Girl underscore CFH underscore 1966, who says the remake. Mr. Duran Writer says original 100%. That shit scared me as a kid. <laughs> me too. Tim Curry Pennywise is the reason 
reason I am terrified of clowns as an adult and still to this day am terrified to watch the first It movie because it does scare me. It brings me back to that time as a child when I was absolutely terrified of clowns. The final girl next door underscore says they're both so different, but she prefers the OG. JG.90 likes the original for creepiness. J underscore Vils 14 likes the original. And another one of my favorite people on Instagram, Skellington fan, says she loves them both, but for different reasons. The original set the tone. Tim Curry was scary without CGI. Thank you. Thank you, Skellington fan. Exactly. Some These are my people. <laughs> These are my people right here. Tim Curry was terrifying without the need for CGI. All right, so let's get back to it. Let's talk about the plot of Stephen King's It, the novel, which was released in 1986. The story starts in 1957 during a rainstorm in Derry, Maine. A six-year-old boy named Georgie is sailing a paper along the rainy streets of Derry before it washes down into a storm drain. He gets down, he looks into the drain, and he encounters a clown who introduces himself to Georgie as Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Georgie's enticed by Pennywise to reach into the drain and retrieve his boat. However, the clown attacks him and rips his arm off, leaving him to die out in the streets outside of the sewer drain. The following June, we fast forward into 1958, there we see an overweight 11-year-old boy named Ben Hanscom who's being harassed by a bully named Henry Bowers and his gang of misfits. They escape into the marshy wasteland known as the Barrens, and it's there that Ben befriends an asthmatic hypochondriac named Eddie and stuttering Bill, otherwise known as just Bill, who's actually Georgie's older brother. So the three boys later befriend more misfits. They find Richie, Stan, and Beverly Marsh, and then they refer to themselves as the Losers Club. <laughs> What a great name, eh? So the summer draws on. The Losers Club each encounter Pennywise in terrifying manifestations. Ben sees him as a mummy on a frozen canal. Then there's a fountain of blood coming from Beverly's sink. Eddie sees a rotting leper. And then drowned corpses totally plagued Stan. And a frightening phantom of Georgie is what Bill has to deal with. So absolutely 100% terrifying, right? This story does not pull back any breaks on delivering scares, terror, and sheer fear into anybody who reads it. So at the same time that all of these encounters are happening between Pennywise and the Losers Club, Eddie Bowers is becoming more and more sadistic and unhinged. And he starts focusing his attention on his African-American neighbor, Mike Hanlon, and his father. So you can see where that racism undertone is going to come in. So Bowers kills Mike's dog and then chases him into the Barrens, where this is where Mike ends up meeting the Losers Club. And they drive off the gang in a rock fight, and Bowers vows that he's going to get revenge, right? This kid's pissed off. He was just trying to kill this African-American kid or at least beat him up. And then he ends up getting saved by a group of kids and then hit with rocks and has to run away. So, of course, he's humiliated, but he's definitely going to come back for revenge. So, Hanlon becomes a member of the Losers Club. He reveals his own encounter as well with Pennywise. He saw him as a flesh-eating bird. And Mike proves to be a very valuable addition to the Losers Club because he actually has a historical scrapbook that makes the kids realize that it, quote-unquote, is an ancient monster that has a hold on the town of Derry. Following further encounters between Pennywise and the Losers Club, we then find out the origin of Pennywise is that it's an ancient alien entity that came to Earth and begins a cycle of feeding on children for an entire year, followed by a 27-year-long hibernation. So Bowers is back, he is definitely getting his revenge, and Eddie is hospitalized by him and several of his friends, while Beverly witnesses one of the bullies, Patrick, kidnapped by it in the form of a mass of flying leeches. Man, that's a way to go. Could you imagine getting kidnapped by a bunch of flying leeches? and then just like eaten alive that's fucking terrifying so patrick obviously does die the losers club discover a message from it in patrick's blood which warns them that it will kill them if they continue to interfere so they end up making two silver slugs out of a silver dollar hoping that silver can wound it and they enter the abandoned house where eddie bill and richie had previously encountered it and try to kill it so they manage to wound Pennywise with the silver while it's in a form of a werewolf. And it's at this point that Pennywise deems the Losers Club a bit of a threat. So he manipulates Bowers into murdering his abusive father and chasing the losers into the sewers to kill them. Where he's accompanied, of course, by his other bully friends. They're both killed by it. And Bowers becomes lost in the sewers, completely traumatized to the whole events that occurred. So now they're in the sewers and Bill performs what's called the Ritual of Chud in an attempt to face it in the macroverse, the alternate universe where Pennywise 
Pennywise is from. This is where he meets the monster's antithesis, Maturin, an ancient turtle that created the universe. Bill learns that it can only be defeated during a battle of wills and sees its true form, the Deadlights. Bill then beats the monster with Maturin's help. After the battle, they don't know if they actually killed Pennywise or not. The Losers Club then swear a blood oath to return to Derry if Pennywise ever resurfaces. Bowers completely lost his mind. His sanity's gone by the time he's out of the sewers. He becomes institutionalized and blamed for the town's child murders. And this is where we get the second narrative of It. So now we're going to fast forward to July 1984, where three youths are brutally attacking a young gay man named Adrian and throw him off a bridge. This is where a bully and Adrian's boyfriend see a clown appear. Adrian's then found mutilated and the teenagers are arrested and charged with the murder. So now we know it's 27 years later <laughs> and the murders are happening again. Violent child killings are happening in Derry again. So Mike Hanlon, he's an adult. He's now the town's librarian. He calls up the six former members of the Losers Club and he reminds them of their childhood promise to return if the killings ever started again. Bill's now a successful horror writer living with his actress wife. Beverly's a fashion designer married to an abusive man. Eddie runs a limousine rental company and married a hysterical codependent woman similar to his hypochondriac mother. <laughs> Richie's a disc jockey. Ben is now thin, successful, but he's a lonely architect. Stan's a wealthy accountant. So these guys, despite their childhood and despite what they had to go through and despite their trauma, they still found success. <laughs> like each and every one of them is in some way, shape or form living a successful life and hopefully living their best life. Like, I don't know. We don't know necessarily if it was their dream to do what it is they're doing, but they're obviously living a very healthy, successful life despite their past trauma. And prior to Mike calling all of the former Losers Club members, they all had completely forgotten each other and the trauma of their childhood, which kind of explains how they were able to be so successful. It's probably once they left Derry, right? Wink, wink. <laughs> Yet despite this, everyone from the Losers Club agrees to return to Derry except for Stan, because Stan actually kills himself and commits suicide in the bathtub instead of facing it again. Now, all of the Losers Club end up in Derry. They're meeting for lunch, where Mike reminds them that it awakens once every 27 years, and it's up for about 12 to 16 months at a time, feeding on kids before it goes into slumber again. So they got to stop these killings. Their goal is to fucking put it in the ground once and for all. So that's exactly what they go out to do. Mike makes a suggestion that each person explores different parts of Derry to help restore their memories and remember what happened. While exploring, Eddie, Richie, Beverly, and Ben are each faced with manifestations of it. Eddie sees them as Belch Huggings and childhood friends in leper and zombified forms. Richie sees a Paul Bunyan statue. Beverly sees the witch from Hansel and Gretel in her childhood home. And Ben sees Dracula in the Derry Library. In the meantime, Bill's wife is worried about him, so she travels to Derry. Beverly's abusive husband ends up showing up, intending to kill her, and Bowers escapes from the mental asylum with help from Pennywise. So the story's about to take a very interesting turn, because now these guys are not only needing to run or fight it himself, they're now going to have to fight Henry Bowers and Beverly's abusive husband. Yay, gotta love adult life at making things way more complicated than they need to be, eh? <laughs> Fuck. So Bowers finds Mike, he confronts him at the library, but Mike makes it out alive, and it instructs Henry to kill the rest of everyone in the Losers Club. But Henry gets killed when he goes after Eddie. It's at this point that Beverly's husband is then ordered by Pennywise to kidnap Bill's wife and bring her to his lair. <laughs> so Bill's wife gets kidnapped by Tom and brought back to its lair. She becomes catatonic, and Tom drops absolutely dead in shock. Bill, Ben, Beverly, Richie, and Eddie then learn that Mike's near death, realize that they're being forced into another confrontation with Pennywise. It's not over. You're going to have to face it once again. So they descend into the sewers, and they use all of their strength as a group to send energy to Mike, who fights off a nurse that is under control by Pennywise. Once they reach its lair, they find that it has taken a form of a giant spider. Bill and Richie enter its mind through the ritual of the truth again, but they get lost in Pennywise. Eddie injures it by spraying his asthma medication down his throat, but then it bites off Eddie's arm and kills him. It then runs away, trying to tend to his injuries from the Losers Club, but Bill, Richie, and Ben chase after it and find that it's laid eggs. Frightening thought. <laughs> right? Isn't that terrifying? Can you imagine two different layers to this? Okay, so imagine that you're in this, this sewer, and you're trying to find Pennywise. You turn a corner, and all you see is Pennywise laying eggs. 
Like, is that something that anybody else has ever thought of? Is the the image of Pennywise laying eggs? Because there's there's these eggs in the sewers. There's only one way for eggs to happen, right? He's got to lay them, right? Am I wrong? Immaculate conception of eggs? <laughs> Like, what's the deal? So imagine that, right? Turning the corner and you see Pennywise laying the eggs. But then at the same point, you've got this terrifying aspect of what the fuck are in those eggs? <laughs> what the fuck is he laying? Is there more Pennywise clowns? Is there more of him? Like, that's fucking terrifying. Or at the end of the day, is it all just a mirage? Is it all just him playing his fears so that he can try to escape and win the battle at the end of the day, right? So they see all these eggs and Ben stays behind to try and destroy them. Bill and Richie head towards the final confrontation with it. Bill starts to fight his way inside its body. He locates his heart and destroys it. So the group heads up out of the lair and they realize that the scars on their hands from the blood pack they made all those years ago has disappeared, which is a symbolization that the ordeal with it is finally over. At the same time, the worst storm in Maine's history sweeps through Derry. The whole downtown area collapses. Mike concludes that Derry's finally dying. Now that Pennywise the Dancing Clown has been taken care of and he's out of the picture, we find out that the town of Derry is dying. So really, that's symbolic that the town of Derry was built on this negative energy that it created. That's the symbolism that Stephen King's really giving in this part of the story. So the Losers Club return home. They gradually begin to forget about it, about Derry, about each other. Mike's memories of the events also begin to fade, as well as any of the records he wrote down previously. So everything's beginning to disappear as if it didn't happen. The Losers Club wins. At the end of the day, at the end of the story, the Losers Club takes Pennywise out and they're able to go on with their lives and there's no more child killings and by the looks of it, probably no more town of Derry because it's fucking collapsing. So that is the kind of rundown synopsis, Cliff Notes version of it. The story itself is past a thousand pages, so even my plot synopsis there of the story of it doesn't encapsulate exactly for one how terrifying and how intricate the story really is it's an amazing novel by stephen king and if you haven't read the book yet i would highly suggest going out and getting it it's i would say in my top three favorite stephen king novels of all time it's definitely one of the best horror novels of all time and it's going to terrify the hell out of you when you read it even more than watching the movies i guarantee it because the way stephen king can graphically depict the violence and the sheer fear that pennywise brings is something that no one else can bring to life. <laughs> now that we've gone through the terrifying Stephen King novel, It, we're going to do a comparison of the book itself between the miniseries and the rebooted movies that were to follow. Now, both the miniseries and Stephen King's novel saw Mike Hanlon's character kind of narrating the circumstances of the Losers Club and entices them back to Derry with the deal to take out Pennywise once and for all. Although, the remake of It changed Mike's backstory. He was orphaned by a house fire and then oppressed by an overzealous uncle. His bolt gun becomes the gang's weapon of choice against Pennywise, which replaces the slingshot and sl silver slugs that were in the book. And another big difference between the novel and the film is actually the time period. Because in the Stephen King book, 1984 to 1985 is when the Losers Club are adults. The book goes back to 1957 and 1958 when they were kids. The film has, a, has the Losers Club actually growing up during the 1980s. So they changed the era of the story for the actual reboot compared to what it was in the book. And one of the most iconic aspects of it is the ability that Pennywise has to transform into each child-specific fear. The kids in the novel grew up during the heyday of B-monster movie madnesses, right? Like in the 50s and 60s. So Pennywise took on the shape of the iconic monsters of that time, right? The mummy, the wolf man, creature from the Black Lagoon. And it might have been fun to see Pennywise take on, you know, the, the moniker of some of those iconic monsters from the 80s. But we don't get that in the remake, right? The biggest strength of the miniseries version of it is Tim Curry. Hands down, his red and white face paint as Pennywise the Dancing Clown is really what made the miniseries the cult classic that it is today, and really personified fear for kids everywhere and anyone who watched it at the time. So Bill Skarsgård had big shoes to step into and fill, right? Like, he was a sewer dweller, giggly childlike apparition, he had wonky eyes, strong sense of the uncanny, he was able to encapsulate Pennywise, and he was able to actually strike fear 
Whether that be through his facial expressions, whether that be through his body posture, or just the terrifying idea of a clown smiling and laughing as it's waving a severed arm. Like, that kind of thing is terrifying, and that is absolutely creepy. A little bit more so than Tim Curry, I'll give them that. The movie also opted for more contemporary and specific horrors, with Mike being tortured by images of his parents in a fire and Stan seeing a scary painting in his father's office comes to life. That's a huge jump from the mummy, the wolfman, and the creature from the Black Lagoon, right? And it's because they made the movie in a different era. They made it for that time frame, that time period. They didn't want to redo what the miniseries did. They wanted to do something a little bit different while still staying true to the actual concept and the source material, which I can appreciate. Not many horror movie reboots do that. They don't stay true to the source material. They try to go off in their own direction and they add lore. They add things to the franchise that fans don't want and the franchise doesn't need which then in turn makes it difficult for more entries to come out because then you end up just retconning the shitty movies, right? There's no point. And those are just some of the differences between the book, the miniseries, and the movie. There, Of course, you can't take a thousand-page book and put it in like a, what was it, three-hour movie, I think, at the end, three and a half hours. And the miniseries itself, I'm pretty sure, was like three or four hours that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. So it is difficult to take that much source material and even make it for screen, right? Because a lot of that is in our imagination. A lot of what made the novel terrifying was our imagination. The fact that Stephen King is so good at depicting fear and depicting what scares us that we're able to imagine it and it terrifies us. Even with The Shining, that's another book that's very similar to the tones and the way that Stephen King scared the audience and the reader is The Shining. It's another story where you're just terrified from your imagination, right? And that's really where the scariest parts of our brains are, is what 